God, it's really, really weird for a visual artist to be facing a stage audience. I should have thought about this before I signed up for this. Um, I think the reason for this is because uh, in a museum or a gallery, I'm never in front of you. And you assume that I'm never there, but you're wrong. You know, one of my jobs as a professional artist is to spend long periods of, periods of time snooping out on museum conversations, trying to follow you around, see how you go about when you go see pictures. Um, what's interesting about the way people move within a museum is pale compared to what the reasons why people still move towards museums. When you think about it, in, a, in a, the moment where most museums are actually making their collections public through the internet, we're actually picking on a, it's, it's, it's never been so many people visiting museums in the world. You know? What is it about a picture in a wall that still elicits this power over people? You know? When you come to think about when you are actually in front of a, uh, when you're actually moving towards a picture that's in a wall, you're going against this really thick uh, flow of visual information that's naturally coming your way. You're going against the tide, but you still you do it. What is it about that you know, makes you go to a museum instead of just downloading a picture on your cell phone? Well, by watching you, the way you go about things when you visit a museum, I've noticed a few things. First of all, a still image is not still at all. As a matter of fact, there's not such thing as a still image. And as you, you, you know, I, I've noticed you doing it, you all do it, because I spy on you all the time. <laughs> when you're in a museum, you, you know, try to walk casually, trying to pretend you are disinterested, and all of a sudden, try to find something that catches your eye. And when you do, you move towards that, that uh, image, and say it's a painting, you know? And you stop, short of an imaginary line in the, li in the floor, and you do something quite weird. You do this. <laughs> you all do, because I've seen it. <laughs> and what, why do you do that? It's actually quite simple, you know? By the time you get to that imaginary line, you're up to the point where you can actually see what that image is trying to tell you. It's what the artist tried to tell you, what, the, what that actual visual thought represents. And when you get closer to it, you get to see what it's made out of, you know? Normally, let's say a painting is made out of really disgusting things, you know, stuff that is dug out from the ground or is actually being extracted from plants or animals. But when it's actually carefully put together, we carry an intelligence, it gets to become that picture you see when you get a little bit away from it. And when you get close to it, you see something that's just material. And when you get far from it, you get something that's ideal. As you approach it, you see matter. When you get away from it, you see mind. But something tells me, because you're doing this again, 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 you're not looking for the matter or the mind uh, part of this bargain, you know? Somehow, you're actually looking for something right in between, when something turns into another, this magical moment of transformation, you know? And you're enjoying the crossing of this threshold that separates the world of things that you can understand and know from the world of things that you can just feel and assume. It's a, there's something at the right moment when something becomes something else, this little bubble, a little air, a little gap that produces a, a sort of a suspended logic. I cannot explain quite well how it feels. I can give you an example. It's just like when the, uh, you know, the ball has left the hand of the basketball player and hasn't reached the rim yet. Like what you feel a second before a first kiss. Or like one instant after the punchline of a real good joke. Try to get that on your cell phone. You know, photography for 24 years have allow, has allowed me to actually reproduce this feeling. Because w with a photograph, you have a chance to enhance or to extend the, the moment in which, in, in which one thing transforms into something else. Because you can shift scales in a photograph. And also because you can recognize a material within a picture, you can also play this game of mind and matter I just exemplified to you a second ago. And, um, you know, when I started working with uh, art, 
I thought of making these very simple pictures that have split meanings, and it was something like producing these uh, really simple puzzles that I was given to the uh, viewer to be put back together. When you look at this, you think of a pencil drawing, but at close attention, you know, when you look close, it's not a pencil drawing. It's actually a photograph of a sculpture made out of wire, and you start asking about uh, how big it was it, how long did it take to make it, it was three-dimensional, it was flat, and before you know, you're not just looking at something, you're actually thinking about the way you look at something. From this simplicity of simple lines, I went into a little bit of more uh, elaborate subjects, like uh, actually making drawings, accumulating thousands of yards of thread over a single surface. From lines, I went to dots. Now, this is a picture of my, uh, of uh, just, it's a drawing made with soil over a, a, um, a light box. It actually represents my hands. In a similar technique, just in negative, and I drew with sugar. You know, these are portraits of the kids from the Caribbean islands, sun kids, and they are done with sugar. And then that's, when you actually use a material such as sugar, you add another meaning to it. It's something synesthetic, something that uh, uh, haptic. You know, you're thinking of a taste. It actually, the plot thickens right there. When I started thinking about taste and how you could infuse the sensation of taste in pictures, I started thinking about working with chocolate. Chocolate is a very complex uh, substance, and as, as much as it is, uh, uh, it's a cultural invention as much as an industrial one. And when you, uh, it, it evokes a serious, an enormous uh, range of sensations. They're, they can go from uh, luxury, romance, guilt, obesity, scatology. Everything you draw with, with chocolate is doing, is, affects the image you're drawing with. You know, we are in, always inflicting meaning into pictures. I think about, uh, uh, you know, I, I drew things with something that uh, evoked the idea of value as well, like in drawing things with, with diamonds, you know. Um, there was this, uh, this famous slogan that actually saved the diamond industry in the, in the late 40s. It was called, a diamond is forever. Yeah? So is granite. <laughs> uh, when you think about value implicit in pictures, you know, I conducted this uh, uh, experiment a few years ago in which I invited a group of people that had no contact with art whatsoever to come to my studio and work on their portraits using the material that they used every day. In this case, these were scavengers. They work in a garbage dump nearby. The project took over three years of my time. It was subject of a film called Wasteland. They received very many, many, many prizes, including an Oscar nomination. What I learned from it is actually I could share this thing that I love to do the most, is actually play with ideas and images. And I could do this with a group of people that with no contact with this whatsoever took the same pleasure, and it, this experience changed their lives as much as it changed mine. After this, you know, I could never look at uh, uh, an audience or look in a museum crowd in the same way again. If you haven't seen this film, I really, it's not because it's my film, I'm not selling it, you can see, get it on uh, net, you know, you can get it for free on the internet if you want to. Uh, you know, dealing with very lofty, big ideas, when I start making larger and larger drawings, I realized I became aware of this, uh, um, not only a material entropy, this loss of meaning that it exists both materially and also uh, uh, it, 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 it's a semantic entropy. The, more, the larger the things I was making, the less significant they become. You know, a few years ago, I paired with some, a mining company and I did these really humongous drawings in central and northern Brazil. And the fact that, you know, I wanted to really uh, uh, make a contrast between the effort, this Byzantine uh, logistics of putting this thing together, you know, and the banality of what they're trying to represent. They're really stupid pictures, but they took a lot of work to do. You know, there are about 30 of them. Um, when you're dealing with really, really large things, you know, you, don't, you lose your ergonomic connection to them, and they become purely mental. Thinking of the same way about big things, you know, I, pay, I uh, did a stint with a residency at MIT recently, in which with the help of a friend, Marcelo Coelho, we actually managed to translate 
drawings that I had produced with the 19th century device called the Camera Lucida to a 21st century technology called FIB, which is a focused Ian beam. And with this, we were able to actually make these very intricate etchings of castles on single grains of sand. When you think of something that's utterly invisible, actually, they're more like grains of dust, you know, because if they would be here, they'll be floating around. Now, I want to make a portrait of my daughter, which is two and a half year old, uh, and, and not make a picture of it. I want just to throw it in Ipanema Beach with the hopes that one day when she's there with her boyfriend, when she's like 14, 15, she'll look at the beach and go, do you really love me? Can you find my portrait in it? <laughs> um, you know, when you start playing, this is, okay. When you start playing at that scale, you start having uh, actually different ideas about to deal with things. This is an old wish of mine, was actually to create pictures with living things. And also at MIT, I teamed up with a, a, a bioengineer called Tao Denino. First, I wanted to just do pictures with like mold or some kind of substance that would be very um, big, you know, the big, relatively big. But Tao actually uh, uh, helped me do these pictures, which with the aid of stencils, a little, uh, um, you know, we can actually make photographs with living cells. Uh, this thing is not really working, you know. And what we were trying to do, we're trying to inflict some kind of a comfor comfortable, logical, geometric pattern to something that at first looked very chaotic. Uh, but our familiarity with these things taught us that, you know, the order and the behavior of these, things, of these cells actually surpassed by far, you know, this geometry they were trying to impose on them. These are uh, actually a picture of, um, sorry, it's actually a picture of liver cells in which you can see every single cell and every single nuclear in it. This is our vaccinia viruses. These are actually cervical cells, HeLa cells, they're cancer cells. Uh, and uh, this, I'm working recently with uh, stem cells and hoping that we're, this is the, our last piece that we're trying to do and try to make it with neurons, which are very hard to do. For each uh, uh, type of tissue, each type of bacteria or virus, we need to change the complete apparatus in which you work. You know, we scan it differently. So it's been taking a long time to get this series to a gallery so you can see it. Lastly, you know, we're talking about parts and holes. You know, everything, every time I, I, I show my work in retrospect, I realize that I am a sort of mosaic artist, you know. I grew up poor in the outskirts of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And my, the visual history of my childhood is comprised of nine pictures that my uh, aunt, my mother's sister, took of me. She, because she owned a camera and she lived in Miami. So every year she visited and she took a picture. It took me another year to get to see uh, what she had done. When I was, a, you know, growing a little bit older, you know, by the time I started finding pictures of family pictures in like uh, 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 garage sales and, and, and flea markets, it surprised me to see that these pictures had somehow became lost. They sort of like took an independent path. They were orphan pictures. And, and I always, whenever I had money, I bought them. You know, that initial little hobby became a collection that now has more than 100,000 items. And for those of you who uh, collect vernacular photography, um, you know that the only way you can organize these collections is by just uh, classifying them uh, by what they are actually trying to mean. When you're playing with that, before you know, you know, you start realizing that uh, by making like these pictures, like this is actually me, by the way, uh, you have the picture of the boy with the bicycle. It's called 25th of uh, December. You have the photograph of the couple. You have the photograph of the wedding, you know? And before you know, you start realizing that you're actually organizing these very, very uh, generic moments that punctuate the, the, the rhythm of our lives. That perhaps they're actually, were very, very influenced by photography itself. It's interesting that in about five years ago, you know, this material started being dumped uh, in the internet. I've started being able to buy them in like, in, in like a, a lots of like 25,000, you know. And all of a sudden, my house had become this huge mausoleum of orphan pictures. And I thought I had to do something with them. 
Actually, the moment you know, I start finding these pictures more available in the internet coincide with the fact that cameras were being installed in every single cell phone. We've somehow changed our habits towards pictures of ourselves. You know, we spend more time taking them than looking at them. And what was once uh, something that was passed from father to son, like genetic, genetic heritage, you know, the photo album has become completely obsolete. Some really amazing rupture has happened in a way in which you relate to our past. About uh, almost 200 years old, we, came, we have come up with a technology that was powerful, powerful enough that we trusted our entire history, both private and collective. And we thought this would be the perfect receptacle, receptacle of it, you know. And, you know, nowadays, we seem to have improved the technology to such extent that we turn the, that, uh, the trust in that document completely obsolete. It's, a, it's something that is happening, it's so recent, you know, and I don't think I have answers for it. I think my last project here in Rio is a school. It's a school of visual literacy for small children, you know, because I believe education will be the only thing that will help us survive understanding our heritage, understanding our history, and actually being able to continue a project of history and civilization in the world where we cannot trust anymore visual documents. Thank you very much. I, uh, I actually don't have a question for you. <laughs> because I have 100 questions and there's no time. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you for what you did for TED back then, what you've done since in your career. Your work is just jaw-dropping. Oh, man. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.